I want you to imagine continents on fire, earthquakes and tsunamis sweeping the globe, what isn't vaporized, crushed or drowned freezes as the smoke blots out the sun. That clip from the movie Armageddon is our future. It will happen. But don't freak out, there is good news. Unlike viruses and hurricanes, we now have the technology to completely prevent apocalyptic disasters like this. Unfortunately, they're also completely inevitable if we don't act. What's the problem? The danger and inevitability of these cataclysms are lost in the technical jargon of scientific papers. How do we fix that? To explain a solution, I need to give some background story. As a Navy pilot, I trained to drop nuclear weapons. Now that should make you consider your own mortality, not to mention the mortality of the human race. At 23, I was probably less concerned about dying than looking bad. But that all changed. I lost one of my best friends in a crash, and several years later, I came very close myself. I was an F-18 instructor, and we were flying a low-altitude training mission over the desert. We fly about 500 miles an hour, 100 feet off the ground. It was getting late, and the sun was about to set. My student did a high-G turn into the sun. At that speed, we cover about two football fields a second. I remember this sudden, overwhelming, visceral sinking sensation like the horizon was rising too fast. Without thinking, I grabbed the stick. We did a high-G pull away from the ground. We got back to the base and reviewed our cockpit video. We came within 20 feet of the ground. Now, that may not sound that bad, but the wingspan of an F-18 is 44 feet, and we were in a 60-degree angle of bank. That motivated me to do a little research. I discovered that almost 60% of all tactical jet fatalities are pilots literally flying into the ground. You get overwhelmed. You're trying to navigate, communicate, monitor aircraft systems, and you lose track of minor things like avoiding the ground. So I found and started working with a vision scientist named Dr. Leonard Timmy, and we created a new type of altitude warning system designed to scare the crap out of pilots, like I had been. It uses a, an artificial horizon projected into the pilot's peripheral vision. Get too close to the ground and it rises rapidly, creating a, a kind of a falling sensation and scaring the pilot into acting. Fast forward. After my Navy career, I realized pilots aren't the only ones that ignore things that will kill them. As a society, we're remarkably good at that. We get overwhelmed by environment, economy, politics, etc., and we lose track of minor things like avoiding our extinction. But how do you create an altitude warning system for the human race? I started collecting and studying cataclysmic disasters. These are inevitable but preventable extinction level events. As you can imagine, I don't get invited to as many parties as I used to. I took these events and I rank them using something called probabilistic risk analysis. It's a fancy term for a simple concept. It just looks at two things, consequence versus probability. It's the same science your insurance company uses to figure out your premiums. In this case, the consequence is pretty severe. It's the extinction of the human race, or at the very least, knocking civilization to its knees. The probability, can it happen tomorrow and can it take us out in a matter of days? Well, that narrowed down only three inevitable but preventable extinction-level events. I only have time to cover one, but I'll briefly mention the other two. Before I do, however, a question you should be asking is, why is this guy qualified to talk on this subject? My educational background is engineering, but the short answer is nobody's qualified. There are no interdisciplinary degree programs that span everything from solar superstorms to artificial intelligence. Instead, I use a, a cadre of brilliant experts and advisors. They include renowned astrophysicists, meteorologists, computer scientists, to name a few. So, what made the list? Well, remember the criteria. As bad as global pandemics and climate change are, the requirements for these cataclysms are they have to be able to take us out in a matter of days, not decades, and be completely preventable. So what are they? Well, honorable mention goes to a type of genetic engineering called gene drive. It probably won't cause our extinction, but it has the ability to literally change the face of humanity. Check out the TED Talk by Jennifer Kahn. That brings us to the number three threat. It's a solar superstorm. It has the ability to completely obliterate the world's power grid for months, if not years. I'll cover it in detail in another talk, but look up the Carrington event of 1859. It's happened before, it will happen again. But again, it's completely preventable. We can protect ourselves. That brings us to the number two threat. Computers have been doubling in computational capacity about every two years. We see it every time we buy a phone. The best one to buy is the one that came out immediately after the one we just bought. 
but we should still have at least several decades before we can create an artificial intelligence with the same computational power as a human mind. Unfortunately, we're forgetting about these. Smartphones have maybe the IQ of a lobster, but there are over two billion of them out there and they're becoming more and more connected. If you link them together uh, via software into an ad hoc or mesh network, one that mimics the neural network of a human brain, their combined computational power could be thousands of times greater than a human mind. I may be thinking, okay, but just because we create a super intelligent AI doesn't necessarily spell our demise. Maybe, but I can't help but notice the IQ difference between a chimpanzee and a human is roughly 60 points. That relatively small difference, however, is enough to create 8 billion of us and a permanent place on the endangered species list for the chimpanzee. Maybe we need to stop worrying so much about evil supercomputers like the Terminator's Skynet and start seriously considering what happens if Siri or Alexa wake up and they're not happy with us. I'll cover how that can actually happen in another talk, but again, this is completely preventable. That brings us to the number one threat. Data from the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty's monitoring system was declassified and released. The good news, there haven't been any atmospheric nuclear tests in over 20 years. Yay team. The bad news, there were over two dozen massive explosions caused by asteroids blowing up in the atmosphere. This video by the B612 Foundation illustrates the size and frequency of these impacts. Fortunately, most of them came in over the ocean, but you may remember the one that came in over Chelyabinsk, Russia. It detonated with 25 times the power of the Hiroshima bomb, and even though it blew up 18 miles high, it still injured over a thousand people. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's really interesting, but so what? I mean, nobody died, right? The so what is actually huge. For the first time in history, scientists were able to plot actual impacts, and from that, determine how often the Earth is really getting hit. Previously, we had to use very indirect methods like trying to count craters. Now, this paper by Dr. Peter Brown et al. should have been headline news. But the scientific community, understandably, frowns on titling papers or we're all going to die, so we end up with the not quite as terrifying enhanced hazard. This graph, which I've simplified, is telling us that the impact rate is higher than we thought. But it's not that scary until you realize this is a logarithmic graph. The impact rate isn't 20% higher. It's not twice as high. This is telling us that the impact rate may be 10 times higher than we thought. But what does that really mean? We used to believe an impact big enough to obliterate a city happened every thousand years or so. Now it's likely in our lifetime. One big enough to set a continent on fire, plunge the world into a global nuclear winter, starving billions. We thought those happened every 100,000 years or so. Now we're talking 10,000 year intervals. But I remember thinking, well, if, if impacts are this frequent, shouldn't there be some historical accounts? Well, 70% of the Earth is covered in oceans, so that's a likely impact point. If you slam a mile wide asteroid into the ocean at hypersonic velocity, it will vaporize over a billion metric tons of water. Now that water is eventually gonna have to come back out of the atmosphere in the form of rain. And it could take, oh, I don't know, 40 days and 40 nights. Conjecture. But it's interesting that every major civilization has a legend of a great flood. Regardless, there's plenty of direct evidence. The Tunguska blast of 1908 lines up perfectly with the new impact rate. And remember those 10,000 year interval impacts? You know, the continent on fire, compressing a century of climate change into a matter of minutes type of impacts? Well, there's growing evidence that one of those happened 12,800 years ago. There's an avalanche of new research that suggests it took out the woolly mammoth, saber-toothed cats, and a huge chunk of humanity. If the 12,800 year date is confirmed, it will totally validate the new impact rate and then some. And frankly, should be a, a terrifying wake-up call for all of us. But there is good news. NASA and astrophysicists have found a remarkable 95% of the asteroids big enough to take us out. But that still leaves hundreds of potential civilization killers and thousands of asteroids big enough to annihilate cities. And it gets worse. We're forgetting about comets. If all the asteroids were marbles, they would fill a dump truck. That's a lot of marbles. But if all the potential comets were marbles, they would fill a line of dump trucks parked end to end extending for over 60 miles. Yeah, but, but aren't comet impacts rare? Well, unlike asteroids, the comet threat may be more periodic. 
Many scientists now believe centaurs, which are basically supersized comets, drop into the inner solar system every few thousand years. As they swing around the sun, they break up and form huge clouds of smaller comets and debris. These periodic shotgun blasts may be responsible for many climate shifts and extinctions. Regardless, we've actually seen comets hit planets. In 1994, we witnessed comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 break up and slam into the surface of Jupiter. If it had hit us instead, it would have killed billions. But that's Jupiter. What about closer to home? Well, you know those shooting stars that we enjoy watching? Most of them occur during meteor showers. Meteor showers happen when the Earth passes through the debris trail of a comet. A comet that crossed Earth's orbit. In other words, a comet that missed us. There are over 100 meteor showers a year. So, in addition to finding asteroids, we just need to find these comets, right? Not so fast. We can barely detect asteroids. If the asteroid belt where asteroids hang out were the size of a baseball, the Oort cloud where comets hang out would be the size of a baseball stadium. They're way, way too far out to detect until they're inbound, at which point we might have less than a year or two to impact. Unfortunately, most deflection strategies require at least eight years to execute. Here's a quote by Dr. William Napier, one of the world's leading comet experts. Deflection strategies that assume decades or centuries of warning are inapplicable. That's scientific language for we're all going to die unless we have a deflection system already in place. Right now our only option is to lob a nuke and pray. But even if that works, we might have just traded a rifle bullet for a shotgun blast. So, our current strategy to deal with the comet threat is to ignore it. Now, to be fair, that's not an unreasonable strategy if there's nothing you can do about it. But now there is. One very promising technology is called D-Star. It's basically a, a huge phased array laser that will be deployed in space. Although it would be bigger than the International Space Station, it's not exactly a Death Star. It, it doesn't have to vaporize asteroids or comets. Instead, it burns a divot out of them, and each divot creates a little puff of gas. It acts like a tiny rocket motor. Over time, that would slow the asteroid or comet down. Delay it by just a few minutes, and the Earth won't be there when it arrives. It's a huge added bonus. The same system can be used to massively accelerate spacecraft like the Starship to Mars and beyond. Unfortunately, there is no funding to develop or deploy systems like these. NASA and the other space agencies are driven by government policy. Government policy, in turn, is driven by public perception. That's us. So let's put this in perspective. You and I are now more likely to die in an asteroid or comet impact than a plane crash. But unlike a plane crash, an uh, impact would probably take out our family, our future family, and everyone we've ever known. And a plane crash is just a possibility. A cataclysmic impact is 100% guaranteed. It will happen. We just don't know when. So, without a rapid deflection system in place, we are playing Russian roulette with billions of lives. The challenge we face isn't technology, it's priority. The human race faces a staggering list of problems, from war and starvation to racism and injustice. But asteroids, comets, and solar storms are equal opportunity killers. They don't care about our politics, nationality, skin color, or even species. The coronavirus was a wake-up call for pandemics. It's why I can't do this in front of a live audience. But if we wait for the same thing with these cataclysms, our wake-up call could be our epitaph. Dr. Ed Liu, former astronaut, Stanford physicist, and CEO of the B612 Foundation, summed it up. Referring to the Las Vegas truism that the house always wins, he said, we're not the house. Now, there's also a huge positive side to all this. We have an incredible opportunity to unite all of humanity against a common enemy. And for the first time in history, one species has the ability to protect all the other species on the planet. There's a switch. But it will require a, a huge international effort. And the problem is that none of us know anyone killed by an asteroid, comet, or solar storm. It just doesn't seem real. How do we change that? How do we make it real? Ironically, my altitude warning system used fiction to impart reality. Seconds before impact, it projects a fake horizon into the pilot's peripheral vision, scaring them into acting. In other words, it's fiction that will become reality if the pilot doesn't act. So, why can't we do the same thing with extinction-level events? Ted demonstrates the incredible power of combining education and entertainment. 
but Game of Thrones and The Walking Dead still had larger audiences. What if we could create stories where we replace dragons and zombies with much, much deadlier but real threats? I'm not talking about docudramas, I'm, I'm talking about genuine fiction, but fiction that has to meet one critical requirement. The threat and the solution have to be scientifically validated. That means having a, a technical director and a board of experts who have the final say, but only about the threat and the solution. Everything else would be left to the creatives, the authors, directors, producers, and video game makers. I call it science fix-it fiction. Maybe thinking entertainment driving government policy. Yeah, sure. In 1998, the movies Armageddon and Deep Impact were released. Coincidentally, the same year that Congress mandated NASA find 90% of all asteroids one kilometer or larger. So, instead of having Bruce Willis drill oil wells into comets, entertaining, scientifically questionable, we create movies, series, video games with equal death-defying drama, but doing something that might actually work. And then we wrap them up with experts validating the threat and the solution and a very sobering message. On our current path, we are destined to follow the dinosaurs. Disney and Paramount special effects are very impressive. Unfortunately, they're also pretty accurate. This is our future if we don't act. But we also add a powerful message of hope. We now have the technology to prevent our extinction. But to do that, we all need to become part of humanity's warning system. Look, if you can, read the research papers yourself. But at the very least, if there was ever a message that needed to go viral, this is probably it. And for those in the science and entertainment fields, we need to paint our future in terrifying detail. We need to add emotion to the logic. The dinosaurs didn't have TED Talks. They didn't have Netflix either. Thank you.